that we all live under um, and that we see reproduced in hundreds of films, television shows, and, and in our communities. Uh, so we're here to actually uh, talk about um, both the, the real life experience of practicing other forms of justice as well as, as people's visions and aspirations for it. Um, I'm going to briefly just name our three uh, dear dialoguers. <laughs> um, and then we'll actually um, start with a brief video that Miriam Kaba from Chicago, who has come here from Chicago to join us from an organization called Project Nia, uh, from Project Nia, and um, Miriam will tell you a lot more about that. Uh, Danielle Serrett from Common Justice, and Ajara Dixon, who was the founding coordinator of the Safe Outside the System Collective of the Audre Lord Project. Yeah. Let's give. Yeah. And um, wanted to start off with a video. I'm going to turn these the house lights off just for a second so we can watch it. And hopefully there will be enough technical difficulties. <laughs> Uses Bluetooth. <laughs> I still have to plug stuff in. We 
are the ones who have adopted an archaic justice system that is gripping the throat of young men of color. Young men of color. Uh, I'm blessed to have certain disciples in my life. I believe every community should have a space for them and for that actually accepts them, like Precious Blood Ministries that was mentioned earlier, or the other restorative justice hubs that are now being developed. And another thing is, if you really want to look for the work, you can find it. There's spaces all over the city where it's restorative justice is popping up, and it's all about getting involved. It's not like this is a brand new idea that's coming. And real quick, what Circles offered me was somewhere I was, where I could sit and share vulnerability with young, other young men in the city, a kind of taboo, not just for young men of color, but in general, for people to address patriarchal and masculinity in our own lives. It was, a, it was a space that respected me for where I was when I came to it, didn't ask questions, didn't make me wear a uniform, didn't force me to be there. It was a space where I was appreciated, where I, my voice was appreciated, my presence was appreciated. It was a space where I could sit with my brothers, sit with my brothers in solidarity in a city that where if four or more of us are hanging out in a corner, it's mob action. And I think that's why restorative justice means to me, a lot to me. And I hope that these words today stir something in you. Thank you. so dedicated to come out on a Wednesday night to, to hear us talk about restorative and transformative justice, um, which is really important to me in my life. Um, and I'll talk a little bit about how I came to kind of become a practitioner of RJ and TJ. Um, but what you just saw is a video of one of our leaders from a project that we incubated um, a few years ago called Circles and Cyphers. And Circles and Ciphers is a hip-hop leadership development project for young men and now some young women who are gang-affiliated or prison-involved in some way. And um, it's the basis of Circles, as you've heard the young man Ethan speak about, is transformative and restorative justice, more restorative justice than transformative justice, though the restorative justice practices are done within a framework that's meant to be transformative. Right? And you heard him use language like patriarchal masculinity. I assure you that when he came to the program, that was not his language. <laughs> yeah? But over time, as they learn and grow and discuss, we think about oppression in context. We think about its impact on our lives. We think about the ways in which um, it is you know, the glue, basically, that violence is the glue that holds oppression together. Right. Um, and so we really think about that on a regular basis. In order to be able to uproot violence, we have to be able to uproot oppression. These things are co-constituted and reinforcing and reproducing. Mm -hmm. And so I, we want young people that we work with to also understand that, to understand what's going on in their lives in a broader way, not just in an individual, everyday struggle kind of way. Those things are important too, but connecting that gives you a political consciousness that allows you to see yourself and understand yourself differently and provides a power that's hard for you to be able to, uh, you know, as the system tries to take your power, you're gaining power by learning more about what the system really is and how your role in it is not just as an individual being oppressed, but that we're all in this together and that it's going to take building collective power for us to be able to make these kinds of changes. So our young people understand the notion of collective power building, right? Because that's super important to be able to get free. Um, and ultimately, that's what we're trying to do, right, is to get free. Um, so I wanted you to hear him talk about the project in, uh, in terms of circles. It's only one part of the work that we do. I'll talk a little bit about some of the other things we do. But I wanted you to hear it from his own voice because it's always important for the people who you supposedly are uh, working with, who are supposedly most impacted by the thing that you're doing, to have their voices heard talking about that thing. Uh, because I can tell you a lot of things, but as long as they're not the ones who are experiencing it, and I have in my own head, as removed as I am, though we share a racial affiliation, we don't share much else, you know, in terms of my experiences and his. We didn't come from the same kind of place. We didn't have the same kinds of experiences. 
it's important for them to shape and talk about their own lives in an important kind of specific way. And I'm glad that you got to see that. Um, so I'm from, I'm originally from New York. I was born and raised here. So this is coming home for me, which is always good. Um, and I grew up here on the Lower East Side. Um, I, you know, have had an experience that is, uh, I don't know, maybe not, you know, I came to the work of kind of thinking of abolition of prisons from the perspective of somebody who did a lot of work on anti-violence against women and girls stuff, right? So I came out of kind of my politicization started with a concept around race and racism and then moved quickly to addressing violence against girls and young women based on my own survivor experience. Um, and when I was doing work in the late 80s um, around anti-violence against women and girls stuff, this was a beginning of the process, I think, the full-on process of the professionalization of that movement into a field. Mm -hmm. Right? A lot of the people who had come, right, like a generation before me had basically birthed the movement as something that was radically different than what it's become, which is they wanted to end violence, and that what we have now is a field that wants to manage violence. Mm -hmm. Those are not the same things. Mm -hmm. When you want to end violence, you build movements to try to do that. When you want to manage violence, you can build a field that's focused on people having jobs that are professional to treat violence in certain kinds of ways. The analysis is totally different, and so too is the then strategy and the solutions that are proposed, right? I pretty quickly, I came to doing that anti-violence work from my own personal experience as a survivor of rape, trying to figure out what justice looked like for me in my particular situation. And I knew very quickly for myself that my justice did not involve the perpetrator of my rape going to prison for lots of reasons, yeah? But I couldn't find any places that would speak to that because the fields that I had come to come against only had a couple of options for mm -hmm. me. And mainly it was report, mm -hmm. <laughs> report to the very cops who I had zero trust in, having grown up, having a bunch of my friends consistently harassed, targeted, and incarcerated by that same system. I had no interest in going to the cops to report, yeah? But I had no place for me within that space. So I tried to struggle and try to figure out what else, what else, what else, and I couldn't really find a niche for myself. I went and taught for a couple of years at a high school in Harlem. Um, I, and I taught social studies. And in my second year, one of my students was killed by another one of my students. He was 16 and she was 15. And when the murder happened, we were all stunned. Because what we knew of this young man was that he was most certainly not a monster. And we all loved him. And what we knew about the young woman was that we loved her too. And we were left struggling with figuring out where we were going to hold all of these things together and what we were going to do, what was going to be the recourse. And in particular, if you think about a space where a bunch of young people who have both their friends have tragic, the one person who did a horrible, horrible thing, but was not a horrible person, and one person who you loved who's no longer here, who you want accountability for that person no longer being here too. So what ended up happening very quickly was that our school people took um, sides very fast. Who was supporting this? Who was supporting that? We had to try to find a way to, to break through that. That's how I came to restorative justice, was because I didn't know what to do. We had two things pretty quickly become apparent, was the district attorney wanted to try him as an adult, and that meant 25 to life. But if he stayed in juvenile, then he'd be out at 21. We knew we wanted to try to intervene so that he'd be tried in the juvenile court. It provided our school community something to organize around. And we knew we then had to go and speak to her family to ask them how they felt about him not being tried as an adult and whether they would do what seems impossible, right? When you lose your daughter, 
which is to advocate for this person not going to jail for the rest of his life. So myself and another teacher went and met with the family of this young woman. And what I learned there was a lesson that I'll never forget that allowed me to feel brave enough to always advocate for something different. And that was, the, her mother turned to me and said, we love him. You know, they were dating. It was a dating violence situation. I never knew about dating violence at that time. I didn't know that teenagers had, I mean, you know, I was not clued in. I don't know how many people knew that. But I ended up going and doing a lot of work and starting curriculum that were teen dating violence curriculum that I left right after that to do that work. Um, but, but, you know, she said, we don't want him to die in prison. That's not what we want. That means I will have lost two people. So she, and to her credit, Everlasting, went and advocated for this kid to be put in juvenile. He graduated, he went into prison, he spent five years, he came out of prison. This young man is now a social worker, a father of three, and is, does some of the most important work in this city with young people. Again, people do bad things without being horrifyingly bad people. And we do sometimes have to find ways to account for the harm without disappearing the person. And so that became the beginnings for me of trying to think through what else, what else that should exist besides this way of doing things. How else can we intervene in a way that allows for people to also be able to heal? This current system that we have, an adversarial, incredibly oppressive, all the isms that you want to have all together playing themselves out within that system, deeply, profoundly unfair, is not justice for me. It's also not justice for many other people. So therefore, we find ourselves having to look for new places and new things that we can create together that will provide more of a sense of justice, more of a sense of an ability for us to repair harm and heal, um, and to do that in some sort of real authentic way. So years passed, and I started Project Nia in Chicago after having started many other projects and organizations over my lifetime. Uh, organization called the Chicago Freedom School, an organization called the Women and Girls Collective Action Network. I mean, just, I build organizations. That's, I'm, I'm somebody who believes that we need to have containers for people's energies to exist in. Organizations often offer that as a space for people to be able to use our collective ideas, thoughts, and power to be able to transform and change the world. So that's my ability and what my talents lie, you know, where my talents lie if I have any. I'm not an actress, I don't draw, I don't have, you know what I mean? I don't do vacations. Like, I have a lot of things that I can do. I know how to build spaces and create organizations that I know how to do. Right? So, um, so, so these are all the things that I came to over a long period of time is to remember why it was that I cared about what I was trying to do, what I wanted to bring together in one place, and that ended up, ended up being Project Nia. Mm -hmm. And I was not supposed to talk beyond 15 minutes. <laughs> so here's what I want to do is allow the rest of my uh, esteemed dialoguers to go off and do stuff. And I could talk later more about this nuts and bolts about Project Nia. Yeah, and I can also do that in questions that you may have. Does that make sense? Yeah. yeah. We can do that. Okay. Yeah, let's get back to those nuts and bolts. Yeah, <laughs> we can do that. Yeah. It's taken all my strength not to give you my 15 minutes. Um, <laughs> <laughs> you can put me on the clock for 30 we seconds. We brought you here, just, <laughs> we brought you here for a reason. Please um, <laughs> no, but I'd love to just take a second to let that absorb before we mm. move through. You can clock me for it. Thank you. Um, I'm Danielle Sarad, and I direct Common Justice, which is um, an alternative to incarceration and victim service program for serious and violent felonies based in restorative justice practices. Um, what that means in human terms is that in cases like gunpoint robberies, stabbings, serious assaults, if and only if the people who are harmed want to. Um, people are diverted with the consent of the district attorney into a, an extensive preparatory period. Um, after about three months, 
We bring both parties together with their support people, so family, friends, neighbors, mentors, people with a stake in the outcome, and reach a set of agreements about what the responsible person can do to make things as right as possible. Those include things you might expect, like do community service, pay restitution, apologize, go to school, get a job. They include things you might not expect, like a harmed and responsible party, that's what we call victims and defendants or offenders. Um, and we do that because it defines their relationship to an event, not their whole identity. Um, so the harmed and responsible party meeting each other's children. So this man who was robbed at gunpoint saying, I want you to meet the children whose father you almost took away that night with your gun. And I believe today in the father you can be to your baby girl, so I want to say that to her face. So like, we all go to a bouncy castle. Um, harmed and responsible parties, one who shot at the other in a public park, doing a speaking tour in their neighborhood about the impact of cycles of violence on their lives. Harmed and responsible parties making a movie about their experience in the program together and like learning how to make a movie. Um, a harmed and responsible party, one where the person who really seriously mugged someone else, so stole his money and beat him badly, um, taught him self-defense techniques. So in the course of this dialogue, um, you can imagine how my general counsel felt about that concept. <laughs> um, you know, in the course of this dialogue, the young man who's responsible for this harm says, you know, every man older than me in my family has served at least 10 years in prison. My older brother served 11, and every one of those 11 years, he won the Prison Boxing League Championship. And he's the man who taught me to fight. And that night on the street, I showed you the wrong end of it. But he's also the man who taught me to defend myself. And if you want, I'll teach you that, too. Wow. And the little talking stick goes, we'll talk about talking sticks. Um, those are the nuts and bolts. They're not even nuts and bolts. It's a stick. Um, <laughs> it's like lower tech than nuts and bolts. Um, passes it to him, and the man who was mugged said, I would love that. And after I clear the vision of my general counsel from my head, you know, we start to move forward. And in that example, we go to, uh, to the Center for Anti-Violence Education, which some of you may know, um, where the wonderful director can hold that space for us so that we can do it safely. And the responsible person teaches the harmed person um, self-defense techniques. So first he stands like he's the one who's harmed and he demonstrates like you push here and like twist here and that sort of thing. He's better, don't use that at home. Um, and he does it over and over, right, while the person who was originally mugged is holding him and modeling it. And then they switch places. And the person who was harmed is there in the position of, that he was in that night, being held by the same man who held him that night, and practicing these things. And at first he's not very good at it, and then he is increasingly better at it. And the person who was holding him is using more and more of his strength until he's using all of it. And repeatedly, this man is releasing himself from his grip. Um, the harmed party in that case had suffered from really serious post-traumatic stress, which means all the things that our bodies do when we're hurt, right? So he would say whenever someone came up behind him, even if it was a little old lady, his whole body would freeze up. So his body would freeze, his adrenaline would rush, his stomach would churn, he would feel hot, his head would you know, he couldn't think clearly. Everything would contract, right? And the day after we did that self-defense class, he calls me and he's like, Danielle, I'm calling to tell you nothing happened which doesn't seem like a like, cell phone emergency call to me. And so I was like, can you say more? And he said, I walked by a six foot four man and nothing happened. Right? Like his body didn't freeze, his mind didn't race, his stomach didn't turn, right? He was, and he had about half an hour before he had to be at work, he worked in the back of a restaurant for cash and he had been taking cabs home every night, which took half of his wages. Um, and he had half an hour before he had to be at work and he went to Times Square so he could walk by as many people as possible. Um, and he's on the phone, so you think, like, hold on, I see a tall one. And he's like, nothing. Right? Um, are, there are a few, so those are some of the agreements. The responsible parties have a year to fulfill them. They go through a 15-month violence intervention curriculum that supports them in understanding where their values about violence originate in their own experience, in their own culture, in their own lives, um, interrogating those values, setting goals for themselves, um, becoming accountable for what they do, thinking about what they owe to whom and why and how to do that. Um, and in the meantime, we work with the people who are harmed to support them and what happened to them and in their lives generally. So we're unique in the country in a couple of ways. We're the first alternative to incarceration within the criminal justice system as we know it um, that diverts cases of serious violence into a process like this. So we haven't done that before in this country. Um, it is not the first time, as the young man in the video said, that cases of serious violence have been handled by processes like these. Right? These processes are much older than this 
very strange and effective thing we've invested in profoundly and are embarrassed to pull out of, right? Um, we're also unique in our realism about who victims of crime really are, and this connects to the arc that you described so powerfully about the victim's field, which is that a young man of color is ten and a half times more likely than me to be robbed or assaulted, and it's still people like me in most victim service programs. I deserve them, so does everybody else. Um, and so we also think about what would victim services look like if we started with a young man of color in mind, and we know that doesn't just mean taking out the Madonna quote and putting in a Tupac quote, right? We know that for each of us, the way we heal, the way we move through pain, what accountability looks like is deeply rooted in our cultures and our experience. Um, and so understanding and answering that question means constant deep engagement and dialogue with the young people whose lives are at stake. Um, we think about, I should also tell you the stories that I'm telling you I have permission to tell and have told in the way I'm telling them to you to the people whose lives they're about. So if you've heard me talk before and you hear me tell them the exact same way, it's not because I'm boring. I may be boring, but that's not why. Because um, we take people's stories very seriously and the way we tell them very seriously. And so I have very specific permission for which stories I share, including people being like, like their stories I'm only allowed to tell in a room that's more than half people of color as best as I can judge it looking into the crowd. So like those I can't tell here. Um, and so we take, the, we take those permissions really seriously and honor them. So I'm not sharing um, something that I'm not, um, that I haven't been given the honor of sharing with you. Um, we know there are a few core lies that we don't believe. Um, one of those is that the interests of the people who commit harm and the interest of people who are hurt are inherently opposed. We have an adversarial system that makes that increasingly true the deeper you are into the process. Um, but the nature of human beings is that our lives are interconnected and our needs are interconnected. And even after we've hurt each other, we remain each other's family and each other's neighbors and each other's community, whether we like it or not. Which means we have an investment in the person who hurt us becoming better because they live on our block and they we may love them, or we may just not want ourselves and people we love to be hurt by them. But either way, that connection remains true. Um, we're told the lie that people like me are most likely to be victims of crime. That is not a lie invented by the victims movement in the 70s. The story that white women are in danger and black men are dangerous is the founding myth of our criminal justice system in America. We have been telling that story for a very, very, very long time. And it was not true when we started telling it. It hasn't become more true in time. Um, so that lie motivates so many of our practices, and it's dehumanizing for all of us. Um, it is dangerous to the survival of people of color, and it is dangerous to our humanity as white people. Um, we're told the story, the lie, that what victims of crime want is for the person who hurt them to be incarcerated for as long as possible. Fewer than 2% of victims of robbery get help when they've been hurt. We have no idea what people want, right? If I was like, well, I talked to 2% of people and everybody likes chocolate best. You'd be like, you're out of your mind. Like, it's bad methodology. It's like the best analogy I've been able to give is you did a survey in line at the hamburger spot about people's favorite food. And we're like, everybody loves a juicy burger. Yeah. Right? Like, and you need to talk to the people at the Chinese food spot and at the salad place and the people who brought their own lunch before you have any sense of what it is people want. We also have all had the experience of eating something that didn't nourish us, that made us sick, that we didn't like, because we were hungry, right? Because it was the only thing available. And that's what incarceration has become in this country for people who were hurt. So when we say to people, to victims of crime in the system, do you want prison, we are asking them, do you want something or nothing? And of course, when we're hurt, we want something. Yeah. We don't live the same way. We don't always live in the same place. We don't work the same way. Our lives are upended. The way we love might be upended. Do I want something or nothing? I want something. And how much do I want? I want the most because that is how much I am hurting. Mm -hmm. What we find is that if in, after you ask, do you want something or nothing, which you kind of shouldn't even ask, <laughs> seriously, but if you got to ask it instead of assuming the answer is yes, then you ask, do you want this or that? 90% of the victims we've talked to have chosen common justice over incarceration for the people who hurt them. Those include people who have scars from here to here, lacerations to their liver, collapsed lungs, guns to their head, right? The sorts of things that are not like, oh, this kid stole a candy bar from my store, which are the examples we usually get in restorative justice. Um, and they choose it for a lot of reasons. Some of them choose it because, like in the example, 
you shared there, like this person is my people, right? That this I'm con I know this person, or I am connected to this person, or I recognize myself, my child, my loved one in this person. And sometimes, like one woman, her son was really brutally robbed, and he, she said, you know, at first I wanted him to drown, and then I wanted him to burn to death. And then I realized I didn't want either of those things. I wanted him to drown in a river of fire. She's like, but I have to ask myself three years from now when that, I'll use the word young man, that is not the word she used, um, when that young man is walking down the street. My nine-year-old son will be 12, and he'll be coming and going from the corner store, and he'll be coming and going from school alone. And I have to ask myself, where do I want him to have been for the last three years? And while if I had a machete in my hand and he were in front of him, I would gut him and chop him to bits and bury him six feet under the jail myself if I could. And believe me, I believe this woman. Um, the truth is I would rather have him be with y'all. Right? So she does what our criminal justice system is incapable of doing, which is to make a rational decision about the public safety as opposed to an emotional decision about vengeance to feel the desire to vengeance, for vengeance, to feel the fury, to feel the anger, to be connected to those emotions, and not to choose it as the course forward because she cares about the well-being of her children and her neighbor's children. And she is willing to put that over her own temporary emotional satisfaction. If the mother of a child who has been beaten can do that, a system who hasn't lost anything should be able to do it too. Um, the other lie we're told is that we don't know what to do. Um, like we don't know what else to do, especially about violence. We might know what else to do about misdemeanors. We might know else, we know to do treatment for drugs. If you were here Monday, you have heard some thoughts about that. Um, but we said we don't know what to do about violence. Um, we are taught that more often than we are taught almost anything else about ourselves and about one another. And so at Common Justice, the main thing that we do is get everybody out of the way. So we were talking before about what we're experts in. I'm like, I'm becoming an expert in getting people out of the way so that people can do what happens when people sit in a room together and address the harm and say, this is what you did. This is how it impacted me. This is what I want to know. This is what I need. And the people responsible saying, this is what I did, and this is the impact I understand, and I will do those things you need, because your healing is taken, and so is my dignity. Right? In common justice, their freedom is too. So people who don't complete the program successfully go to prison. On average, our participants are facing five years. All are facing at least one. Some have faced as many as eight. Um, and so they're... they're earning an opportunity to recuperate their freedom, but they're also earning an opportunity to recuperate their dignity. And if there is anything I have learned in my ongoing process as a white person in this country, is that there is no avenue to human dignity other than through accountability. Um, and that it is hard as hell to do. Um, and it is the only way we come back fully to ourselves. So it is, much, is as much for the people who commit harm as it is for the people who are hurt um, that we owe it to make the kind of space for processes where people can engage in the kind of repair that we all fundamentally know how to do when we're not brutally interrupted. Hmm. I'll end with the word interrupted for our day. <laughs> <Thank you. laughs> I think I also have to take a second or a moment because, <laughs> wow, um, I, I feel really thankful to be here. I feel really thankful to the, to the Foundry um, and to just um, hear both of y'all's stories. Um, so my name is, my name is Jaris Dixon, and I, I've been working in social justice movements for about the past 15 years, and I've been working on violence specifically um, homophobic and transphobic violence for the past uh, well, decade. <laughs> you know, it, it hits you and you're like, well, okay, it's still me, am I still myself? And, um, and, but I didn't start working in violence, I actually started in economic justice work. And, um, and part of it I think is because, because I'm a childhood survivor of violence. I grew up in, a, um, in, in an abusive home, um, um, with a physically and emotionally abusive parent. And um, so when I got into anti-violence work, it resonated with me, but it was that place where it was just a little too personal, right? <laughs> um, and uh, 
this work resonates for me because um, there's only one time I remember calling 911, and that was when it was like we were not sure if everyone was going to be alive at the end of that night. Um, and other than that, um, I didn't want my dad locked up. I wanted him to support it or to change, right? Um, so economic justice work was awesome and great and taught me a lot um, about building winning campaigns and the nuts and bolts of it. And I, I'm probably going to talk a lot more about the specific strategies that I've worked on than, than analysis, because it's also my orientation to the movement. I am a deep lover of strategy, and I feel like doing transformative justice or community accountability work for me is about practicing experimentation. Right? But like a rigorous experimentation where you try something, you write it down, and then you're real honest about whether or not it worked. Yeah. <laughs> and, you, and then you, you try something, you tweak it. You, you know, because the, the truth is, is that we need, we need effective strategies. I'm, I'm not going to sit up here and say, this is the world I believe in. Go forth. I'm going to be like, I tried these things. This worked. This did it. Good luck. Let's chat. Um, <laughs> So I started, um, I got hired at the Audre Lorde Project to work at that point w on what was called the Working Group on Police and State Violence. And they've done a lot of work around police violence, police brutality, and a lot of um, anti-war work. But they had been trying to launch this project around homophobic and transphobic violence that was happening in central Brooklyn at the time. And I had, they were like, yeah, we have this history in police violence work, so we're, we don't want to just advocate for police to deal with this situation better. And I was like, bet. Makes sense to me. I was like, I'm going to call the other people who do this work. I'm going to, like, you know, just, like, shift what they do, and we're going to be fine. It's going to be easy, right? Because <laughs> um, that's how I had done it at other places. You know, like, I worked with child care providers, but we called other people. We just, like, adapted. So we called, we called, and there are lots of people who do work around community-based approaches to violence, and they span generations. And you're going to hear me say community-based approaches to violence, transformative justice, and community accountability interchangeably, because I mean the same thing. Like, how do we address violence, work on violence, intervene in violence, and prevent violence without um, using police, criminal justice system, court systems. Um, just so that y'all know that it's not like four different concepts that I'm throwing at you. Um, so, but the thing is, is that there's a lot of groups that had worked on this around, um, around child sexual abuse. There are lots of groups who have done it around um, domestic violence or interpersonal violence, sexual violence. The thing that we, that dawned on us was that, oh crap, we are doing this work with strangers. Because there, is a, a, there are lots of ways to hold people accountable outside of the police if you know something about them. If you know where they go to school, who their family is, maybe where they worship, what other institutions, something else that they care about that you can use to leverage so that they can be held more accountable. But when all you know is that this person was at the same place as this person at 3 a.m. and you don't even know who else is there because nobody's talking about it, what do you do? And so we had that realization about a year in. We were like, whoa. <laughs> this is deep. Um, uh, but we did know we wanted to be safe. And the thing about um, either um, people who harm, people when they are harming people, or um, being harmed, it's an inherent, it's, it's an isolating experience, right? And so we were like, if we just work to like make it so that people aren't strangers anymore, that can maybe lay the foundation for what we need to actually hold people accountable later. And, and really it was that, so we just started to um, contact institutions, whether they were businesses or organizations, and say like, hey, um, we're like, Queer folks in the neighborhood. <laughs> How you doing? <laughs> um, like, would you agree to uh, to not allow um, homophobic or transphobic violence in your space? 
And if you don't know what we mean by that, that's fine. We will talk to you about that. We'll even talk to you about how things escalate. Because many times people understand how violence escalates, but when, because it's a, sometimes it's a sound, right? Like if I had you like close your eyes and say, imagine the sound of violence escalating, you can, you can hear it. But we all put our own distinct cultural lenses on it. So then when I was talking about homophobic and transphobic violence, people, I, don't, I, don't, I don't know what y'all sound like. So, <laughs> and I was like, okay, bet, like we're building the thing we need, right? So, and that's what we did. Um, we ended up recruiting 15 different businesses. And we ended up building strategies and trainings just based on, sometimes we did the opposite of the thing that didn't work. Sometimes we just like had community meetings and said, what worked for you? What would you want someone to do? We created safety tips like that, um, and we, we applied what I had learned of as kind of a traditional campaign development model. Uh, we did a lot of outreach to folks who had experienced violence. Um, we hosted a lot of meetings and forums. We talked about all the things we needed, and then we put them in order. And when we thought about, well, what is the thing that we need the most? And people were like, sometimes I need a place to run to. Mm -hmm. Or I need to know where I can go, and they say they'll try to keep me safe. And then we and then we kind of like slid into like without the criminal justice system piece, which for which people were a lot more comfortable with, but they were just very quest. They're like, but but what do I do? And then we'd start to talk to them. Thank you. And um, and then they'd have all these other strategies. So sometimes you just like I think we've um, all said this. You have to allow people to like speak past the thing that we're supposed to not know, okay. and allow them to then be like. Oh, but I could do this. Um, and, and so um, it was very funny. The first workshop we ever did, um, we, were, we um, borrowed from the, the June Jordan poem. And we were like, this is the workshop because we are the ones we've been waiting for. Um, and it was really just uh, all of us. We, we created safety tips and strategies based off of like, OK, this thing happened to me. I was harassed last night. I tried to do this, I tried to do this. Somebody made a really loud sound in the corner and that disrupted the thing. Or we were like, loud sound in corner. <laughs> and it goes, you know, and, and, and we think about that. We, we talk to our parents um, because as LGBT, as lesbian, gay, bisexual, transgender, people of color, um, it's not like our families had these long histories of utilizing police <laughs> or the criminal justice system to get what we, you know, like it was something that had targeted us. So there's actually a body of knowledge. Um, and so I talked to my parents who both grew up in Louisiana um, under Jim Crow laws. And I was like, okay, mom, I know in New Orleans y'all didn't call the cops. <laughs> I know you did it. They were like, you know, like like in, in 1950, they did not call the cops in New Orleans to disrupt family violence. I was like, who did you call? And she was like, there were, there were these two big dudes. <laughs> One was a teacher. Um, and, and, um, and, it rhymes. One was a preacher. Um, <laughs> that was not intentional. Um, but they, they, but it was the idea that they were leveraging their community power. They were leveraging their community power, and they had close ties to say, we do not want this to happen in our community. And so we were like, how do we replicate that world? How do we rebuild that? How do we just, so like sometimes when I was talking to people about an incident or preventing incidents, I was like, do you know all the stores and people on your regular routes? Do you know them? Have you built with them? Like, I was like, including, like, yes, the dudes on the corner. You need, they're going to be there. <laughs> they're going to be there faster than anybody else is going to be there. And they're going to know what's going on. Those are your, I was like, so are you building with them? Because that's your first step. It's rebuilding those fractured ties that happen in our communities um, and leveraging them um, to, to challenge violence. Um, so, okay, so I guess I can just go to, to lessons. Um, I think a lot of my, my, my lessons were the first around getting rid of judgment. Whether, um, I think there's a lot of judgment on both sides, from people who practice kind of like criminal justice work, and from people who practice alternatives. Like again, you know, like, and, and it's true because we're told we're wrong all the time, so we have reasons, but I'm not gonna judge anybody's safety strategy particularly when we're building them. 
because uh, and so my first lesson is we we did a workshop on um, there's no what, what did we call it there's no community ambulance so what do we do instead um, recognizing the fact that when you call 911 um, in New York City, you also get police, and then also, how do you negotiate that relationship? How do you navigate? How do you? What can you look out for for safety? So we actually, um, the collective was not a place where we said you have to have these politics to come in. Like, do you want to feel safer? Do you want to work together? Do you do the things you say you're going to do? <laughs> like that's that's where because like, I I don't know about you all, but so many of us have been saved by unlikely allies. Yeah. Yeah. So we're not going to put like a barrier at the door. Yeah. And we're not going to say you were wrong because you were bleeding and you called 911. We're going to say, let's ha figure out how we reduce the harm in that situation, right? Mm -hmm. um, I think the other lesson I've learned is the more I do, the less I know. <laughs> and I was, I was saying this er earlier, um, that um, when someone is like, this is the way that you end violence, I'm like, oh, you starting out, huh? <laughs> because I, at this point, at this point, I have worked on, I think, about 25 murders of LGBT people of color. And I can't, like, there are trends. There are trends that I don't even need to, there are trends I don't need to mention. There are trends in, like, how, like, how bodies are attacked and, and things like that. But in terms of this is, this is the way you address it, no, it's about keeping that channel open and being able to figure out, it's identifying chosen family. Mm -hmm. It's seeing if there's limits for chosen family, blood family, all those folks in the room to have like an honest conversation with each other. And it's navigating the trauma in all the myriad of ways that it manifests to try to make some decisions. Which I think is also to my lesson question, the place where it's been hardest, I'm just going to be very honest, the place where it's been hardest to practice or to figure out the appropriate way to practice um, community-based um, solutions to violence has been around murder. It doesn't mean I'm not going to keep asking, but it means that like, I think at that point when somebody is gone um, and we do not have strong and clear strategies as to what the alternative is, it's really hard to say. So do you want to do this other thing? What is that other thing? Well, it could look like this, it could look like that. People, people want kind of a definitive notion in that sense of trauma. And I've thought about that, and I name it not because I want people to, to use it against us and say, well, that's why community-based solutions don't work, but that's where we have to step up our game. Right. That's where we have to step up our rigor. That's where we have to step up our practice. Um, and it's... And, and that's why I went into, after ALP, to do more traditional anti-violence work, not because I was changing my politics, but because I wanted more practice, mm -hmm. and I wanted more exposure. And I actually have had illuminating conversations about violence with like the hate crimes task force. Why? Because they saw more murders than I did. Mm -hmm. okay. So we could say, all right, well, this is what I see, this is what you see. So I would also say, like, allow ourselves to learn from all kinds of different people because we never know where our strategies are, are, are coming from. Um, I don't know if I have, I, I think the other piece that I've, I've really been thinking about is that I'm encouraging everyone to, to, to also, to document your practice and share it and, and sh share your failures um, and share your successes because also they're often in context, right? Um, because we need them. We have done, I think, a, a good job as a movement. Not that like everybody knows why we do community-based solutions to violence, but there has been a lot of exposure to the analysis <coughs> as to why prisons and policing are bad. Um, there's a lot of movements right now who are doing some really good work at rolling back prisons or rolling back discriminatory policing. And that's where they need all of us doing community-based approaches to violence to have a thing to say. Because when they're saying no this, they need a yes that. <laughs> and we're, if we're saying yes because you should, that's, it's, it's not going to fly. And sometimes we're theorizing while people are dying. Mm -hmm. and, um, and, and I don't mean to make it that dramatic, but I, I really... 
there have just been times where there was a woman that I was working with whose daughter um, was murdered, who she didn't know was queer, by um, a former, um, by her, like a previous boyfriend. It was very, very early on, because like what happened as we started to be practice or get good with outreach was that then people were coming to us for individual support and we didn't know what to do. We built it a long time, but we didn't know what to do. And at first, all I did was just listen to, just listen to her on the phone as she cried. What, was, what came out of it was really useful was um, she was having so much trouble accessing CVB. I don't know if you get Crime Victims Bureau funds, their funds for um, um, people who have been um, like victims in the criminal justice system that they can use to access to pay medical bills or other mm -hmm. things. There's like a bunch of hurdles to go through. And if you didn't report, then you have no access to them. So her struggles helped us realize that we created a community-based fund, mm -hmm. like what we called the Living Against Violence Fund, mm -hmm. which was just like, here you go. <laughs> mm -hmm. No application, mm -hmm. no receipts, <laughs> no verification. <laughs> like. You've been through it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Whatever you need. Okay. Um, but at, at, at first, um, I was just listening. And, and, and listening, you know, like, now I have a practice in how I do that. But before, I didn't. Mm -hmm. um, and so for me, building um, a toolbox of strategies, and I really, um, I thank Mimi Kim because she actually created this, like, 700 page toolkit um, <laughs> that you can um, that you can actually I think if you google creative interventions you can um, you can access the toolkit in that way but the more of us that are actually um, documenting the practices that we've seen work in our own lives um, and t tweaking and critiquing um, the others that we come across the more that we build a body of work that um, when people are in the throes of trauma um, we can find a way to um, to speak to them through and about. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I think I'm going to end with like, I hope it made sense. Uh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I want to take a moment to, to actually thank all three of you. Uh, excited about tonight. Um, I have some questions. Do, do, do you have questions and comments? Do you have some things? Collect those. Let's move in. We're going we're gonna to move into that when we start to do this. Um, I'm going to pitch out a couple initial ones. Um, I think there's, uh, there's a story to tell about Project Mia still, right? Um, and also maybe for, for, for us who are living in New York, a little bit also the context of what's happening in Chicago. Sure. It would be great. Yeah. Um, so in the last, I would say, probably 10 years in Chicago, we've built um, kind of a, a interconnected web of folks who are doing restorative justice, community-based accountability, um, and other kinds of community-based responses to harm. Um, and I think, you know, there's several folks who, you know, Mimi comes out of Chicago, and she's a good friend, and so a lot of kind of the thinking around how we think about these things has been going on for quite some time. Um, I started Project Nia five years ago, and my initial thought was that we were missing a space, particularly for young people to, um, who were in conflict with the law, um, to be able to access some of these ideas and thoughts and experiences. And so when I initially started, we were getting referrals from the police. We wanted to get at the front level, the entry level, and be like, divert young people from the very beginning of the system because we know that the more they get into the system, the worse it is for them and the worse they become. So, you know, the system just doesn't do a good job of any sort of reclamation, any sort of reformation, if that's what your hope is. It's a criminal punishment system. I don't even like to use criminal justice or criminal legal system. We have a criminal punishment system. That's what we do. 
Um, that's how we work, right? And so we wanted to stop from the very beginning. And we thought, well, when the cops get a young person, then we'll be in a community-based setting in our community, which is Rogers Park in Uptown, that we would then be a place where they could send these young people. What do you think happened after a couple of years? What's your imagination of what, what ended up happening by setting up a space where the police could send young people? What do you think? No. Something happened. What happened? No, the police, what we were expanding the reach of the prison industrial complex. Because young people who would have regularly been maybe let go, not arrested in the first place, now there was a place where you could send, quote unquote, young people who you targeted or saw as bad. Right? So we were actually doing the thing that we didn't want, mm -hmm. which is getting more young people into the system in the first place. Yeah? Because now the cops had a space to send them. Whereas before they didn't, so they had to actually be more judicious and figure out some other things. So we stopped doing that <laughs> right away. We recognized that our role was not necessarily going to be a system handmaiden where we were going to become another arm for the state. We think there's, a, there's value in that, particularly at different points within the system. Somebody's already adjudicated, indicted, maybe has a conviction. You know, there are other ways in which you might want to partner with the system. But for us, when our idea was to keep young people out, it wasn't a good idea to partner in that kind of way with the system. So we had to kind of learn and change and be willing to change, and I think um, you know, what Ejara had talked about in terms of the notion of always being changed, like being willing to change and being willing to, you know, try things and fail and then, you know, try new things is critically important. And I always think, you know, when you're creating and making things, that's actually the beauty of that is to be flexible enough to be able to try various things because we're all different kinds of people. We all respond to different kinds of things. We're not the same. You can't make cookie cutter kinds of you know, interventions that work for everybody. You shouldn't want to in the first place. Part of what capitalism has done is it's actually rationalized everything to the point where we think we have to have everything the same yeah. for everybody, yeah. right? And we talk about scaling up, replication, you know, things like, like people are not widgets. You know, this is really important. And I think, you know, we all get stuck in it. And then, then you know, God forbid, I used to be a funder for a while. Lord have mercy, you know? Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, as a program officer, it's like, oh, how are we going to replicate this? Yeah. No, yeah. no, not everything has to be replicated, right? And so we're really clear on that in terms of how we figure stuff out. So one angle is circles and that work that we do. We also have a wellness program and a wellness space. Um, and initially we had a community wellness room for many, many years. We just stopped doing that because we wanted to move around in the community. And initially we were in one place. And because our community is like every other community in the U.S. Uh, in, in terms of an urban center, we had a lot of gang issues in terms of turf. And we've had to also figure that out around where young people can go, that safe space within the neighborhood and the community. People always say, well, you work with gang-affiliated young people. How do they all come together? One of the most beautiful things about being in a restorative space is that we've not had one problem with young people who are coming from multiple different gangs. They come to circles three nights a week, you know, and then do stuff in terms of leadership throughout the course of the week. Not one problem between young people who are from these various gangs. Now, if they get outside of the space of that, then all sorts of beef can pop off. Mm -hmm. So the question is, how do we expand these spaces so that beef, you know, gets subsumed over a period of time? Mm -hmm. um, so, so, you know, we, so the wellness space is basically an, a, an attempt to use alter, alternate kind of modalities to connect with our community around healing and healing justice. And so that's incredibly important to the work as well of transformation is we want people to be well. Our system is super oppressive. We have a lot of unwell people because of oppression. And we need to address that in a communal way so that we can actually be able to engage each other in the ways in which we want to be. Because when I come to you and I'm sick, and I'm transmitting my illness to you as well, 
and you have your illness, which you're transmitting back to me in that kind of way, that language, right? We're not being able to be authentically connected with each other. We're coming with a whole bunch of other stuff. Mm -hmm. We have to find a way to heal from our stuff so that we're coming to each other in a different kind of way. Mm -hmm. And living in this kind of a culture, this is very difficult to do across all different social locations that we come from, our communities, our values, our backgrounds. So we do a lot of work around that as well. We also do a lot of work around just kind of getting data and information out into the world from our own voices and our own perspectives. We create a lot of work, like we put out zines. We do work around, we just put out a, a zine series last year called Historical Moments of Policing and Violence, right, and Resistance. And that's a way for us to be able to talk with each other about the fact that nothing is old. Everything, I mean, nothing is new. <laughs> Everything is old. Yeah. And, re and replicates, it comes back, and like, folks were up in Harlem not just yesterday addressing police violence, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. But that's how Malcolm came into being. Malcolm's birthday was on Monday, Malcolm X, right? Mm -hmm. How did Malcolm get known in Harlem? It was from the Hinton Johnson incident in 1957, where Hinton Johnson is beaten in Harlem, <laughs> and they call Malcolm. And you go, did any of you see that movie where Malcolm is everybody standing in front of the police station? Oh, yeah. And he goes like this, and they go, one, that one man should not have that much power. Y'all know what's going on. <laughs> that's a police brutality story. Yeah. yeah? So that's 57. And before that, 1941 riots, 1943 riots in Harlem. What did that start from? Police? Mm. What happened mm. in when Harlem went down in 1964? Police? Mm -hmm. What happened in LA when that went up? Police? Mm -hmm. Like, it's, these are not new things, right? Because certain communities have had antagonistic, hostile, horrific relationships with the cops from time immemorial. We know that. We want our young people to understand that their history is rooted from that place. And we want people to, in our community to stop calling the GD police on each other. We think that's super important, particularly in a neighborhood like ours where a lot of non young, young gentrifiers are moving in and are calling cops when a kid is just bouncing a ball in an alley, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. standing in mm -hmm. front of the, and they're not thinking about the chain reaction they yeah. set in motion by that one police call. Yeah. Right. So we have a program called Chain Reaction, hmm. where our young people interviewed each other about their encounters with the police. We, it's online, alternatives to policing.org.com. Those young people take those stories and then do workshops in the community, in CAPS meetings, in other places to say, this is what happens to us when you call the cops. Stop calling the cops. Yeah? <laughs> like, you know, that's community accountability of a different yeah. kind. Now you've seen this. Yeah. Don't pretend you don't know. Yeah. You know, if you, you're afraid in your neighborhood, in your house, you got your windows locked, you got the kids out, you think, and you think you're going to be safe that way? You're not. You're making yourself scared to death, and those young people do not want to do you harm. But the fact that you look at them and you think they're going to do you harm pisses the hell out of them, and whatever happens, they'll be keying your car next week. You know what I mean? I, somebody asked me the other day, they're like, how is it that you walk down the street, Marion Cabo's car is parked down here, all these other cars, there's people bashing people's cars, and my car is pristine. Why? Because everybody knows Miss Cabo in the neighborhood. I don't care what's going on. I walk by you, I say, good morning. I look you in the eye. I'm not going to be, you're 14 years old, I'm not going to be scared of you. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, you're, you're 14, your pants are so low you can't run. <laughs> There's no problem here. I mean, what really, what are we talking about? Do you know? Stop being scared of people. Because if you act that way, you give it off that way, it's coming back at you that way. You know, and so we have to get to that point in our neighborhoods where, again, this is some little, he's a little kid. And I know he doesn't want to hear that, but he is a little boy, okay? And he's not running me off the street. No, the hell no. And then eventually, you know, over time, it's like they start to know who the hell you are. I get calls. They want to, you know, knock on my door during Halloween trick or treat. I'm like, aren't you 16? What's going down? Yeah. <laughs> Why are you coming for me for some chocolate? So, like, and, you know, we get to that point. That's part of the work. So what, that's what we want to do in Project Nia is make things known to each other, make ourselves known to each other, stop living in the fear, teaching people about our history and understanding that that's where a lot of this kind of oppression needs to be dismantled is in that way. So transform, transformative justice is not just about the practice of the talking piece in the circle. That's important. 
But one of the things that I think we have lost is this notion that just because you have a talking piece in a circle and you leave that circle, that's it. It's not it. That's just the beginning. That's the continuation. You need to keep at it, keep at it, keep at it. And you need to keep calling stuff out that you see that's not okay. Right? Because people start to trust you and believe in you once they see that you are on their side. That's the other thing about young people and people in general. People who look at you, I don't like the term ally. I think we should all kill that term. But I like the term co-struggler. Because I always say, and I say this all the time, I rant about allyship. I rant about it on Twitter. Vicky knows. I'm like, you know what I mean? Like, I do not like that term because it involves no work. Okay? Allyship is very easy to talk about. I'm an ally to you. Oh, really? Show me. I want to know what the work is you've done. You don't get to call yourself some shit and then sit around and be like, I'm there, I'm that person. No, I want to see the work. I want to see you where I am. I want to know what your investment is, and I want you to struggle with me. There's a difference, you know? And so what we need is to build more close strugglers within our communities to be able to hold what we talk about when we talk about transforming. Transformation is work. Transformation is not identity. Okay, you don't just get to sit there and be like, oh, I'm down with the LGBTQ folks, but then shit's going down, you know where to be found. Yeah, I'm down with the black people, but you spouting anti-blackness 24-7, or you're co-signing it by your silence, right? So, like, you got to do some work with me before we can actually transform it. So that's part of this as well, is like that, we got to keep on that work. So that's a little bit about, you know, kind of where we're at in terms of Project Mia. There's a lot of work of ours that's online. We, we, are, we are committed to information activism. So we put out almost everything we have is free for everybody to download. Our curriculum, our zines, our research, all the stuff is up on our website. You can also go to the PICIS.org and download a whole bunch of stuff um, that we've done, including some short films that we do around restorative justice within schools. Um, so you can find a lot of our resources there. You make me want to start using Twitter. <laughs> to maybe grab like three comments, questions, and then turn it back. So saw, uh, this hand, hand right there, is there a third? I want to get in the queue right here. Okay, great. I'm just going to ask, um, as people that practice restorative justice, have you encountered or do you believe that there are people who are beyond rehabilitation? And even if you uh, try to counsel with love, and with forgiveness will continue to harm others for whatever reason without remorse? And what's the answer, what's the restorative justice answer to a personality? Great, question one. <laughs> so if I send your ass to the store, you say hello. If you, you see hello. them, you better be respectful. Mm -hmm. Because if I send you to the store and something happens, yep. you're going to be the first one to snatch mm -hmm. mm -hmm. so All things get something with Nicole. I'm, uh, I'm Danielle. Danielle. I'm Danielle. I'm sorry. Um, I'm Danielle, but I'll I'm answer to that. <laughs> <laughs> I have enormous respect for people to the homeless. You can call me whatever you want. <laughs>
Yes. I wasn't Did supposed to answer that yet. <laughs> you can elaborate a second. I'm just trying to answer. My question to all three of you is, in, in the restorative justice, justice programs, are you looking at the mothers of these kids um, and restoring justice for them? Because I, um, I recently came out of a four-year visit in the federal prison system and had 225 beautiful women walking through a revolving door, um, most of which were mothers. Um, of kids who will only end up being in the system and requiring restorative justice mm -hmm. and have not been able to learn by example because their mothers are afraid for one reason or another and it transcended race, gender, demographic, socioeconomic. It, it just, it transcended everything. It had to do with um, a way that we as women um, are not dealt with in this system. And there are so many over-incarcerated women um, that, you know, and so I'm curious about the programs um, that, that might start at the root, you know, the, the, the people who bring these children into a paradigm that doesn't work. So those are the three questions? And we can answer Simple any questions. More. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one, two words. That's a short one. That's a nice. Okay. We are we depend completely on a partnership with the district attorney because once a case is indicted, the only way with mandatory minimums that that person cannot go to prison is if the district attorney consents. And so there is not after indictment a possibility. The only way that door can open is with that partnership. So we depend completely on our relationship with that newly elected man. Um, I can speak briefly to the mothers and children. Um, we don't do work with the parents in that way. We work with the young people directly. Um, but doesn't mean we haven't done work. We used to be at a school where we ran a peace room for two years which was an alternative to suspensions and expulsions, mm -hmm. um, when we would train community members in restorative practices to go into the school and be there. And initially we started two and a half days a week and ended up being five days a week. We took all of our resources. We had to get out of the school um, because CPS wouldn't fund the project and the program. We had to do it all ourselves. Um, but anyway, the, through that we had uh, an SRO that was across the street. Um, and some of the grandmothers who were taking care of the children came in to the peace room and asked for support, various things they needed that they were feeling like completely lost. So uh, Clay, who was my staff person at the time who was running that uh, initiative, started for two years a grandmother circle, peace circle. So the grandmothers had their own circle that they would meet on Wednesdays at the peace room and they would exchange. It became kind of a mutual support group more than anything. Um, where they had, and they built new relationships with each other so they could depend on each other when things were going down. Part of the problem about being in an SRO in that kind of way was that there was so much uh, lack of trust that was breeded in that space because people were so desperate that they would do things to other people that broke trust. Yeah, and actually what ended up happening is that they then, when we left, took the circle within the SRO and continued to meet. Um, so I think there's possibilities of anywhere people being able to connect with each other and grow from that kind of a space and use the practices of restoration and restorative justice anywhere. Um, and so that was an experience that I saw that, you know, where caregivers and caretakers of the young people we were working with were getting some sort of a mutual support from each other. Um, so that's an example there. I, I can do mothers and I could try to start the rehabilitation. So what about the other questions? So what about the other questions? I'm happy to ask. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah. With, so with mothers, I think there's actually there's a long history of mothers, um, like particularly with murder, mothers who start organizations after um, after mm -hmm. their, their children have been killed. So that's more my experience working um, with mothers. And a lot of my work is sometimes um, uniting mothers with um, friends and family that they of of their deceased children that they did not know were connected to them, and finding ways to kind of collectively make decisions in the aftermath of violence. Um, and I've done some work of like uniting mothers who's who have lost children um, from police violence, 
with mothers who've lost children from a homophobic and transphobic violence because there's a lot more commonalities than sometimes folks would, would think. Um, and that, I mean, I think that some of, some of that work has been, like, there was a time when we were about to do a workshop in a, um, in a middle school and um, around uh, homophobic and transphobic violence. And the parents were incredibly upset. They were like, who let the gays into the school? <laughs> <laughs> That's when you call the mothers. <laughs> That's when you call the mothers. That's when you call the mothers. And I, was, and, and I called um, Desire Brazel, who is um, mm -hmm. uh, the mom of um, Rashawn Brazel, who was murdered in 2005. And his body was found in, in pieces in different parts of central Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. And I was like, Desire, I need you. <laughs> um, because they're not going to listen to me. I need you to come with me. Like, not instead of me, but I need you to come with me. And, and, and talk about why it's, it's critical for us yeah. to, to be able to start to have these conversations with young people um, and the life that you wish you, your son had had. So I think that... Um, um, I, I, I don't think you can address, you can do anti-violence. If, if you're not working with mothers, if you're not working with families, you're doing anti-violence work, you're in that kind of broken, fractured mm -hmm. system perspective as opposed to a community base. Mm -hmm. Like I think like repairing harm is about reuniting relationships and allowing um, a voice and also the empowerment of, of mothers within that. Mm -hmm. So that's, and, um, Oh, beyond, okay, so people, um, part of what I think is that our system treats anyone who's done harm like they're a person who is incapable of remorse, like they're a person that is incapable of transformation. Um, and we've already talked about, I love people are not widgets. <laughs> um, so I think that's, that's, um, I, like, uh, of folks who've done harm that I've worked with, I've, I have not met that person. I am, I am open to the fact, though, that there are times where it can be unsafe for two people to share community with each other, and we need to build strategies around that. Um, but, and I also believe that our system makes people who have done harm, uh, I, I think it, it increases violence. Right, increases and, and sanctions violence, and and I get very and I think when you are a person who's experienced, most people I know who um, have harmed a lot have been harmed a lot. That's like the number one. That's the number one threat. Mm -hmm. um, and our the fact that our movements divide people into uh, divide actions into identities mm -hmm. of the good people and the bad people. Um, allow us to not support and treat people who have been deeply hurt or harmed or people who are deeply troubled and how that can manifest into violence. Um, um, and, and it was even, like I've had so much trouble just finding help for people who maybe I worked on, worked first, who were quote unquote survivors in their first relationship, who then went on to another relationship, who were then causing harm. And I'm not talking about self-defense. Mm -hmm. I'm causing, like, this person is in power, in control, and playing yeah. out the stuff that was happening to them. <laughs> and I know that because I think, like, I've, I've, I've fucking done that, too. Yeah. <laughs> um, so, I, I, yeah, so I, I do think that it could mean another strategy, but I think that that's the first place we go. There are these yeah. people who are, who cannot be supported yeah. and we don't look at it from the how did we get here yeah. um yeah i i love being somewhere where the thing i say after someone else answers that question is that i agree um <laughs> so that's not usually what happens <laughs> i think it's really important that um we not think about personalities mm -hmm. right i guess like, there's mm -hmm. what do we do with those kinds of personalities i think it's important we think about people um I do believe there are people who, if they were released today, or people who are currently free and often holding high offices, um, <laughs> who cannot stop hurting other people. That's yeah, I that's believe right. that's true. Yeah. Um, for people in this room who've survived serious violence, we have beliefs about the people who have harmed us. Yeah. We are entitled to those beliefs, and I'm not going to argue with anybody in this room about your beliefs about the people who have hurt you. Um, 
and will hold my own about the people who've hurt me wherever they are, you know? Um, I believe, and this is really connected to what you were saying, that there are people whom our system has harmed so profoundly yeah. that that harm may not be something we can repair with any tools currently available to us. And that, to me, means two things. It means, one, we are on the hook for building those tools. Right? The same way if there is a disease that people are dying of, we've got a lot of people trying to figure out how to stop that from happening. Like We are on the hook for building those tools together. That's our job. Um, we shirk that responsibility all the time, and it is our job to build those tools. So instead of thinking about what people can't be free, the question to me is who, what type, what people and types of harm can we and can't we hold in our communities, and how can we build communities that can hold more and more people and more and more types of harm so that the burden of the work is on us. The question is, what can that community do, not how bad is that person? What are we capable of holding? So for me, I was like, armed robberies and shootings, we can do that. Mm -hmm. The system's like, mm, these people are above the line. Mm -hmm. I'm like, we can do that. Give them back. Mm -hmm. right? And we do. We have a fewer than 10% failure rate. Find me one prison that comes close. Fewer than 10%. Fewer than 10%. 8.5%. And nobody since January of 2012 has been terminated from the program for new crime two and a half years. Nobody? Find me a prison. Um, so one is like we are on the hook for building things that make us more capable of saying no to that question, not because there aren't people who want to hurt a lot of people, but because our communities are so robust and so strong and so well-resourced, and I don't mean money, that we can hold anything, right? And then the second thing it means to me is that the harm that has been caused to those people who are most often people of color, are most often poor people, and I don't mean like Dick Cheney, which is a sort of separate conversation that we could have in a different space. Um, and, and we know like the kind of people who, like if sociopaths actually are most likely to be CEOs, not on death row, like it's actually just yeah. like, even the psychologists say so. Um, but if someone has been incarcerated many times, like they committed horrible harm, they got out, they committed more harm, they're back in, they got out, they did it again, while they're in, they're doing it more. That is also on us. And to the extent that we have created and benefited from and stood by a system that causes damage that cannot be repaired in our lifetime, we are accountable for it. And that's us. I'm especially talking to the white folks in this room. Like we are on the hook. If there is a hell, we may go for that, right? For the things that we have participated in, been complicit in, allowed to happen, watched occur, benefited from in our neighborhoods, in our rent, and all the police who come through to make sure we're happy there, and all of it, like in all of the ways we have reaped benefit from it as it has carried out irreparable destruction on people's humanity, that the destruction of another person's humanity is a serious thing to be responsible for, and I believe that in my lifetime, damage has been done in my name that may not be able to be repaired, mm -hmm. and that I am on the hook for it. Mm -hmm. And so when I say yes to that question, I say yes with a very heavy heart. Um, I say yes to somebody who doesn't know that there is a pathway for me to redemption for my part in that. Part why I just work all the time. Yeah. You know, like, and I don't mean that I don't sleep, but I mean that we stay in the work. Um, so I think that answer is yes, but I think it means things about us far more than it means things about the people um, that we're asking about. Yeah, I mean, I would say that for me, I've not had that experience in terms of the people I've worked with, but I will say that um, even if I grant you, yes, that there are some people that the numbers are going to be so tiny that we shouldn't worry about that. Mm -hmm. That our worry is the 99% of the people who can be transformed, the fact we're not doing enough to make that happen. Yeah. So my feeling is like, like people telling me, like, you're a prison abolitionist. You mean you want to free them all? I'm like, yeah, I actually want to free them all. But if you're not down with freeing everybody, you pick your group that you think needs to be out. 
and let's free all of those folks tomorrow. <laughs> then let's come back and have a conversation with the rest of the folks that are there and take that group. And, you know what I mean? Because what gets stuck in people's head is always, what about the bad people? And I say, you know what? There are lots of bad people who are not in prison. <laughs> and he's living with them right now. <laughs> and some of them are in the room. Yeah. So I'm saying, you know what I mean? Like, we, we are living with, quote, the bad people, folks. They're not all behind the other side of the wall. A lot of people behind the other side of the wall should not be there, most of them, in my opinion, all of them, but whatever, right? I'll grant you that whatever percentage. But I think sometimes we hold on to these ideas because it's too incredible to imagine a complete different world whereby we don't lock anybody up, whereby we solve our problems in community, whereby we learn to live with each other outside of, you know, constantly struggling with oppression, right? So we gotta hold on to something so tightly that it turns to ash in our own hands. We don't have any way to be able to recoup what's real. So I think, you know, again, give me the folks you want to give me. Once we start taking all those folks and decarcerating them, then you'll be like, oh, the world's not over. It's not Babylon, moving on, next yeah. thing, right? And we'll just keep on to the point where all of a sudden it's like we're without prisons. You didn't even know it happened. <laughs> you didn't even know it happened. You woke up, you're like, we don't have any prisons anymore. Whoa, I got right. no television to watch. That was, you know. Where's, my, where's, my, no where's my NCIS? Well, Victoria's Secret has no place to make my underwear. It's like tea, you know? Yeah. That's what I'm talking about. I would love to get another round in. Uh, here. Here. Yeah. Okay. Kick us off. Okay. Um, I really am curious about this idea of a community response as opposed to, and I wonder about the, trans, the, the transience of communities, the gentrification of communities, mm -hmm. the, the real estate yeah. market, as you will, and how. I mean, everything's intersectional, right? But it would be end everything is endlessly intersectional. So how how do we think about restorative justice when the very meaning of community is constantly in revolution? And that's the thing that I wonder most about. <laughs> Only the simple questions. <laughs> I have a question about how to speak with young people about wellness. I was a young person who, while I was entangled in the criminal justice system, at one of the court-ordered lockdown programs that I was a part of, this really nice white lady came to teach these really poor brown kids how to touch their toes. We call it yoga, whatever, whatever, whatever. It was about breathing and it was about movement. Right? Um, and that was a personally very transformative thing, and that's a practice that I've carried for the past 15 years. Um, and now, as um, someone who walks into a store and when I buy something, they call, people call me sir, so apparently I'm an adult, and apparently I'm in these classrooms, and apparently, you know, I'm an authority figure, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, it's a very, I'm teaching yoga in a very similar situation. My location within that situation is just a little bit different. And I found myself, um, I co-teach with a white woman, um, and I found myself very uncomfortable about not only the way that conversations of wellness are structured in the classroom, but also how the organization that I'm working with, um, how those conversations come across. Mm -hmm. Whether that's not how they're intended, I don't want to say that, I'm saying that how conversations around wellness and on self-control come across is really serves to legitimate right, the incarceration of young people. Say, hey, you're out of control. Mm -hmm. right? So I'm having a conversation tomorrow after a full semester of trying to gain the trust of these young people. I'm having a conversation tomorrow about self-control. And I am struggling with how is it that I can approach this in a way that is responsible to the young people that I'm working with and also responsible to how much violence they've survived. And does not just diminish that and say, hey, control yourselves. And also recognizes that they need more effective strategies to survive on the streets because of the police because of X, Y, and Z. So any thoughts on how specifically to speak to young people about this would be greatly, greatly appreciated. Third question. Um, I'm 
I'm not exactly sure how to put this, and it's it's triggered by your conversations about community, and also the I've been involved with a lot of issues around restorative justice and worked in the buildings, but also work in a fairly entitled university where the students are fairly entitled. And this idea of how do you take some of the things that you're talking about into a community where things happen um, that are illegal or uh, very harmful and there's no process because we only have a process for this. You said the DA has to be involved in these situations. Um, and I do have permission to tell this story. I had a student who was white, who was raped by a white kid in her freshman year of college and was tormented by it for three years. And she wanted to do a project in my class about uh, girls who were raped on campus and confront him as part of the project. And she ended up not doing that as part of the project, but she suffered terribly and saw him around, and he was like the social justice hotshot student. And then eventually he asked her out on a date, believe it or not, through Facebook, and she said yes. And she met him at a, at a restaurant with a friend of hers in the corner, and she looked him in the eye and she said, you know, you raped me, and she went through the whole thing with the hair and the, you know, him holding her hair and pulling her down. <laughs> And he supposedly didn't remember it, but for her, we had been talking in the class about prisons and restorative justice. Mm -hmm. She took everything we were studying in the class about torture victims and other kinds of things to her own life mm -hmm. to restore her humanity to mm -hmm. herself. And she told me that after she graduated, mm -hmm. that she did that. Mm -hmm. But there was no system in the college, really, I mean, honestly, the rape the peer counseling failed her, the professors failed her. I mean, I didn't quite know what to do, you know, breaking confidences. And she felt like she had to take it into her own hands to make him suffer. But there was no, I'm sort of curious about your program because it seems like there's much more engagement beyond that moment because then she left. And so is that really restoring her humanity to herself? We don't know what. You know, she just needed to do it. Mm -hmm. And I'm just wondering how in communities that are not considered violent, how do we take some of this and practice it in places where, you know, uh, well, how do we deal with that? Mm -hmm. I don't really know. Mm -hmm. Can I do respond a little bit to that? I, I think one thing that's interesting is at, at, um, at Columbia University, there's, I know. right, there's a, there's a whole department to deal with uh, sexual assault, right, on campus. I mean, this is an example where, um, you know, this, the Columbia University students aren't the, aren't the people for the most part, sometimes they are, for the most part, not being profiled by the police, not the people being demonized, you know, for generations. This is precisely why Columbia University has the sexual violence response built in. Because they don't want to expose those uh, very privileged people to this criminal justice system we've been talking about. And I feel like that's one of the pieces is, mm. for people with more privilege, you can usually address it yeah. through yeah. private means. Yeah. Yeah. Through, yeah, hiring, you know, through hiring uh, counselors, therapists. Right. It's poor people that's that end up actually yeah. having to deal with the system. state systems. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and, and I'm going to say again, I think this speaks also to your question about community. What do you mean by community? It doesn't, it, we're not just talking about geographic no, no. Uh, connections. No, I'm not talking, sorry, to, yeah. the, to the woman in the back. Uh, what was your name again? Melanie. It was Melanie, that's right, Melanie. Melanie, so our communities are all different kinds of spaces that we inhabit. So just because your community that you're living in in terms of the geography gentrifies doesn't mean that you don't have community that you make with other people on a regular basis who can address those issues in a similar kind of way. So my community is not necessarily just defined by my neighbors or where I live, but my community is a larger group of folks. But, who a, I lot of the, but a lot of the um, conversation has been who's on the street. Oh yeah, sure. Been, We've yeah. talked about it that way. But, yeah. th but the concepts of transformative justice can be applied to various kinds of communities 
however you choose to define what those communities for you are. And so the, the issue about when you said, it's not just that the, so she, this young person was failed by these institutional systems, but the criminal legal system fails survivors of violence all the time, rape victims in particular, who, since we have very small numbers of people who actually get convicted for rape right. and put behind bars in the first place, 96% of people don't get that justice from that source anyway. Right. Which is why, exactly, which is why if we build up more of these alternative kind of spaces, mm -hmm. and many of her friends were trained and could feel that ah, they were, yeah. they would have provided her with that kind of angle that she wouldn't have been left alone with. So when we talk about transforming justice, we're talking about that in a mass way. Mm -hmm. That is not just in your own little pocket, in your own little, but it's your little pocket and my little pocket that intersects together kind of like the rings of the Olympics. And we end up with this massive thing. I don't want to use the Olympics. As well. <laughs> I'm thinking about Brazil. It's like lots of things are going down. But you know, so like that's what's going on, and we're laying the scaffolding that allows for. Okay, the main reason I, I care about transformative justice is because I was a survivor, and transformative justice allows for my voice to be heard in a way that the system can't hold right, right. and will never be able to hold. So it's survivor-centered, not necessarily survivor-defined all the time, right? Because the survivor doesn't have to engage. If they want to, they can engage. The person who is the perpetrator can engage. The, anybody can engage. That's the beauty of the notion of it. It's that we have within our power an ability to be able to work together to solve the problem and quote, repair the harm. The reason I don't use restorative justice, even though I've been using it tonight, mm -hmm. is because for the most part, in a lot of places where harm has happened, we've been depleted of resources. People were marginalized in the first place. And I don't want to restore them to the horrible mess that they were living in before. I want to transform that mess. And I want something new in its place. That's better, that's without oppression, that has a different vision to it, right? That's what transformative justice for me suggests. And it, and it asks you to move beyond the interpersonal and ask you to connect to structural and systemic issues in a way that restorative justice often shirks, right? So there are lots of things that you can think about this way, but what, I'm, what I guess we're all asking you to do is to get out of your today, imagine something different that allows you to actually be able to live to the fullest that you can possibly live, fighting oppression on a daily basis, finding communities where you find them, healing from the harm that's caused to us in multiple different kinds of ways, and that you can do transformative justice in times that are wonderful too. Getting together with people in celebration is also possibly, it's yes. also part of transforming justice. Yes. We're not only needing to come together when there's conflict, yes. we can celebrate each other, yes. we can welcome each other back into the community after we've been ripped out, right? We can find ways to make this a positive project. I am an abolitionist because it's a positive project. Right. I'm building something. I'm not just trying to dismantle. Right. There's a difference, right? Mm -hmm. And so you have to think about the world differently in order to be able to inhabit and create that world that you want to live in. But the anchors of oppression are so deep that we get so stuck and we are so afraid. We are so goddamn scared. And of what I'm not sure, because what we're living in right now sure ain't good. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. The other side is scary. But I promise you, it's not as bad as what we're going dealing with right now. It's going to be better. Take that step. Move from what you don't know what's going to be there, but go. <laughs> go. Figure it out. Shit goes badly. Guess what? You can fix it. Yes, we can. <laughs> that was what Barack got that right. I wasn't that right. <laughs> answer for the community change question, but I have had a lot of experience with it, so I'll share that. Um, which, um, so probably my last year at, at the Audre Lorde Project, um, some of our major safe spaces were like um, being evicted or in the process of, of, uh, of losing where they were, and, um, and so we, we took up that as another um, fight for our own safety, like fighting for our safe spaces to stay. Here's the part that got hard. There weren't enough of us. <laughs> there weren't enough of us to do both. Yeah. Like to do, and so and and it was really hard. Good things that happened were wherever people ended up, the work that we all did together changed us. And they took it. 
right? They took it did, if they ended up in the Bronx, if they ended up in Atlanta, if they ended up, but they took it. Um, and and so there was there's something there in the sharing and the building that was worth it. And it's not that we lost so many folks that we couldn't continue it. We also were very clear about like it was really important for us to talk about gentrification um, because we had a membership of folks, some folks who. Um, would consider themselves gentrifiers, some who grew up in the neighborhood, trying to work on violence. Like, and many times, LGBT, like, queer and trans folks of color who grew up in their neighborhoods can sometimes be read as gentrifiers mm -hmm. um, when a gentrifying process is happening. Um, so, so it's just like, it's, it's, it's like a thing, and targeted in that, like, like newcomer stuff. You know, because it's, it's one of those things, like first the artists, then the gays, da da da. But, um, <laughs> uh, so, so, uh, so it was really important for us to keep building, keep base building, right? Like, I think, like, for me, like, traditional organizing was super important for me. Like, we keep doing outreach, even when there's new folks. <laughs> we keep asking about businesses, even when there's new businesses, and we take up that struggle. The capacity piece was really, really, really hard for us to figure out and the prioritizing so let's say because like what would happen is first we were working on safe spaces then we were working on safe spaces and in individual cases of like violence because we couldn't say we work on violence and then if this person comes to us not work on it right then our safe spaces started to go right like and we were like you know like do an outreach like a mother right <laughs> but <laughs> It was so like uh, that. That capacity question is an ongoing, yeah. ongoing issue that I think it's really critical for me to share. Is like st is something that SOS still struggles with a lot, and that I think we all will continue to, to struggle with. Like, and it's really like how are we building effective movements in the face of ever changing opposition, right? Like that's 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 what it is. Um, I want to say something small on the the wellness piece too. Uh, I've had a lot of white people try to teach me wellness, <laughs> um, and, 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 it, and it really hasn't worked, um, and, and cause it, it does feel like a form of control, right? A form of like controlling something is, that is bad or wrong about me, or like, you know, I work too much, I this too, I am too much, and you're going to have me do all these things to rest, so I'm more palatable to you. Fuck yeah. that. <laughs> <laughs> However, <laughs> I meditate now. <laughs> I, I eat better. But we need to do that within a structural analysis. So we need to talk about wellness within a structural analysis. To talk about, like, a lot of my overwork was trauma-based. Mm -hmm. Running from stuff. Yeah. If I keep busy, yeah. I'm not dealing with it. If I work with people or for people who had it even worse than me, then I don't ever have to see myself as a victim. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You know? So that's my own stuff that eventually kind of like hit me, you know, like, like I had a whole bunch of health issues that happened in the last year from me not taking care of myself. But I needed to have that space with other people of color, with other survivors, with people to say like, we need you to be here. <laughs> we need you to be here because we have mad shit to fight. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and all these forms of oppression are playing out like you are punishing yourself as a part of your own internalized response to oppression. Mm -hmm. So we are going to help you slow down. We are going to learn. I'm, I'm learning to address my own anxiety, which I'm very certain is connected to my experiences of oppression and my experiences as a survivor. So I do meditation to address my anxiety. I do like all these different things. So, but we have to have wellness within a structural analysis. When people are sent to organizations to teach them a practice in isolation of the structural conditions, it is another form of oppression. We need to find a way to break that dichotomy and say like, we're doing this so that our communities can, can thrive. And we're doing this with people, because I need, like for me, someone had to say to me, like, yo, I've been through blah, 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 blah. And then I was like, oh, really? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, because otherwise, like, this white lady who didn't seem to me like she had problems <laughs> telling me to breathe deeply, I was like, people are dungeon. <laughs> I didn't care, you know? So I think part of what we need to do is, um, 
is think critically about like, I don't think the tools of wellness are inherently oppressive, mm -hmm. but the delivery can be. Mm -hmm. And we have to think about how to shift those relationships and how to have more of us who've like been through the fire to be like, these are the things that happened to me when I was not taking care of myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. To then start the conversation like that and to find us different ways to deal with our anger, our trauma, our oppression that allow us to, to live a little longer to support people. Did, do any of the, did you ever do something with the young people already that was a um, kind of a, you know, what, what do we call it, the stop, start, continue? Have you ever done that project with, with youth before? So you, you might ask them, what do they do to take care of themselves, right? And come up with a brainstorm list of all the different things, and you, you allow them to say everything, smoke weed, whatever, right? What do you do to take care of yourself? And then you ask each them in their small group to identify what they want to start doing, each of them, to make a choice. On the, like, what on this list of all the different ways that all these people in this room together came up with this crew of like what we do to take care of ourselves, what you as an individual want to start doing, what you want to continue doing, and what you want to stop doing. Mm -hmm. And you'll be shocked to see at the middle of that stop list a whole bunch of stuff that they've already identified as destructive to them. You use that list of the things they want to stop doing to build your wellness program off of, your wellness conversation off of. You see what I'm saying? Because it's come from them. You're not the one telling them you eat too many Cheetos and Flaming Hots, and you're drinking that red toxic, you know, I want them to stop too, right? But if it's coming from Miss Kaba saying it, no matter what my intentions are, it's just heard differently. It's heard like their mother telling them to stop eating whatever. But if they looked on that list and they came up with it themselves on the things they want to start doing now to take care of themselves, the things they want to continue doing that they think is positive, and the things they want to stop doing, you have the basis now for them to have a conversation with you about their own self-care. Do you see what I'm saying? Does that does that ring? I mean, of course. Right. I mean, I'm, I my pedagogical model is not to go in. Sure, of course. Yeah. Like, that's not the model I'm working with. Right. Um, but but again, it's 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 like it's, 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 I'm trying to. I my analysis brings me to recognize that there are not simply like analytical and psychological contours mm -hmm. of violence. Right. The way that we've experienced violence has not simply shaped our minds, but the physiological yeah, ways yes, that our course. bodies are in relation yeah. to the yeah. world, whether or not this is an example of this man who when some point another man walks up behind him, yeah, 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 yeah. he doesn't decide yeah, yeah. No. to right. be, yeah. a, sure. to feel that any more than a young person on the street who's assaulted yeah. by a police officer yeah. decides to fight back. Mm -hmm. and, and so the question for me is how can we bring like embodied somatic practices into the discussion around social structural yeah. analysis which these seem to be two, like, these are two totally different worlds. And there are people who are having meaningful conversations okay. about the embodied nature of socialization. Mm -hmm. And there are people who are having amazing conversations about structural violence. Yeah. And there are very few people that are bringing those things together, in my experience, mm -hmm. up to this point, unfortunate for me. Mm -hmm. right. No, but I mean, I'm just saying, like, those are some ideas, though, of things you can use to be build the conversation. For sure. And then add in your own curricular pieces. You know, like, one of the things you might want to do to get them back in their bodies might be to ask them to act out the thing that they want to stop doing with their bodies, mm -hmm. silently. Mm. Non-verbally, <coughs> and get them. You know what I mean? Like so, like I mean, I've been working with young people a very long time, and what I have always found to be helpful is that when we start with the base of their knowledge, and they're talking about themselves from a certain kind of place, I can do almost anything with them. Yeah. They're willing to go down the road of trying anything with me if it's their words being used to support that thing, right? So. Just again, throwing out those ideas and then saying, like, use your pedagogical knowledge and the things you know how to do to leverage that and lift that up and connect it to your practice. You know, you can do a lot of stuff curriculum wise. You know, I write curriculum and do a lot of curriculum building, and those are the things we try to do is use the indigenous knowledge of the people in the group to make your practice of what you know how to do really connect with them. Yeah? So that I think that those are some ideas of ways to really build that thing. Get it all out there. These are, I didn't tell you to just stop doing this. You told me now. Now you act that out. Show your peers how to make that done just by movement. You know, and trust with each other. Now two of you pair up and work it out together. Right? And then like 
building the thing. Next thing you know, you got them breathing. You know what I mean? And they didn't even know they were breathing. They were, but they didn't know that they were breathing right. You didn't even know. You didn't even know. Any final thoughts? In terms of just the question about um, like the survivor of the university and that sort of thing. The thing I would say about that is that while the criminal punishment system is applied primarily to poor people of color, it's not messaged as that, right? We're not told, we have this justice system for black people. And you can see, because everyone in line is a black person except for the lawyer and the four Latinos. You know, like, we don't talk about it as what it is. We talk about it as the system for all of us. The longest standing alternative to incarceration in the United States is whiteness. All of us white folks have committed crime and not gone to prison. People have seen to engage us in other ways, to support us in other ways, in concrete ways. We get probation at worst, right? We are seen as people who made mistakes. We are trusted to, our parents are trusted to parent us. They're allowed to, systems trust our parents to parent us. Right? That's, we take that for granted. That is no damn joke. Right? So all the time we are given opportunities. We write essays instead of getting handcuffed and we go to detention and someone takes an interest in us and we do art projects and they encourage us and they, you know, it's like all, like all, all the time. And so when we say, when I'm like, one of the lies is we don't know how to do it, every white person has been through an alternative to incarceration in this country. All of us. And so, and for most of us, it, like, the life outcomes in terms of better income, like, check, right? Better health outcomes, check, right? So, like, the long-term outcomes of the most massive and alternative incarceration in history are really fucking impressive, right? <laughs> we reap them all the time. And so, we know things about what it looks like. The downside of that, and the down, or the downside, there are a lot of downsides, like, our humanity is damaged in the process, but... Um, because it's inequitable. But the downside when we deal with cases of serious harm is that the stories we're told about our collective incapacity to handle harm that are told to us so that we will tolerate the imposition of this system on people of color are told to us about ourselves too. So our ability to do anything else for something serious also atrophies. Because if we start to build it, then we might not even we build it. We're not going to be like, this is the white people's alternative to incarceration for violence for white folks because we believe that we're innately morally superior. Right? We're not going to build that in name. Right? So when we approach cases of serious violence, the larger process of our imagination, of our dignity, of our belief in our own capacity atrophying because we are told we don't know what to do and we internalize that comes back to hurt us too. Because then all of those creative things we might have built that we neatly know how to do, that we could grapple toward together, making a lot of mistakes along the way, are ripped from us as much as they're ripped from anyone else because of that larger story that has to be told to everyone in order to be believable. Like one of the things that has been really important in my development in this work as a white person is understanding that part of why violence against black people exists is to keep me from struggling with them, right? So part of why poor white folks tend to align with rich white folks instead of poor black folks, even though their conditions, mm -hmm. their food, mm -hmm. their living conditions, their needs are far more aligned is because we, is because of the fear of being treated the way black people are treated. And if that stops being too scary, then we start to think maybe we can organize it. Maybe we can organize a union across racial lines. Like you listed off all the, the impetuses that were police brutality. Also, the other moments that you see will be moments of cross-racial organizing, especially among poor folks, right? And so the thing, in order to, for that to remain terrifying enough to keep me, if I am a poor white person, from operating in line with my own self-interest, in line with my own liberation, in line with having food on the table and healthcare for my children and education for myself and the people to come after me and a roof over my head. If I have to be given a lot to not fight for that. And so the alternative has to be terrifying. And so while violence against people of color, I believe, is carried out because of deep-seated racism, because of hate in order to oppress people of color, I know that it is also carried out 
as a lesson to me to stay in my place. Mm -hmm. and, that, and, be, and that means that the more we as white folks organize, the likelihood that the violence against people of color will escalate is really real. Because that's how we are intimidated, right? And so we have to be prepared as we build movements to build capacity to be responsible for that, to respond to that, and to not be like, oh, these terrible things are happening to other people. Thank goodness it's not us, or it's so sad. And God forbid we ever say, oh, I wish it was me in that place, because that's a lie. Yeah. That just respects the pain. You know, but for us to be ready to recognize the way these stories are are not just targeted at folks of color, but are lessons for us about um, how we can and can't and should and shouldn't live. Um, that's a long answer to what to do about <laughs> an incident at the university. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I want us to have a chance, if you do have some time, to stick around to actually just hang out so we can talk to each other in a more informal kind of way. Um, in, I think these were your words, Jairus, uh, I hope that this dialogue has been a space that allows people to speak past the thing That's what I wrote down that too. we're not supposed to know. <laughs> um, I hope we can make more spaces to, to speak past the things that we're not supposed to know. Um, and just want to say thank you again to the three of you. Yeah.